If you're like me and occasionally run out of motivation to go to work, then you might have already asked yourself this question. Why do we work? Looking at a couple of interesting studies in which people around the world were asked why they work or what work means to them, these three reasons usually ranked highest. Work provides us with the means to live. Work provides us with a meaning or purpose in life. And that purpose was usually linked to providing value to society. So initially the question of why we work seems to be easy to answer. But when taking a closer look, we'll soon see that in today's time, our definition of work is becoming increasingly questionable. Let's start with the first reason. Work provides us with the means to live. Traditionally, life has been divided into three main parts. A period of learning, followed by a period of working, followed by a period of enjoying retirement. Moreover, we went to work from Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and enjoyed free time thereafter. Today, in times of constant job insecurity, home office, flexi time, mobile work, lifelong learning, it becomes increasingly more difficult to say that we work during a specific time and use the money earned to enjoy leisure activities during another time of the day or week. This dramatic shift away from a model in which workers earn wages and salaries in a dependent employment relationship with their employers, have stable jobs and work full-time, is highlighted in a recent report by the International Labour Organization. The quality of jobs being created remains a pressing issue worldwide. For example, the number of people in vulnerable forms of employment is expected to reach over 1.4 billion in 2017. In addition, more than 780 million will be working, but will earn less than $3.10 per day. So this basically means that while those who have jobs work overtime or earn too less, Others, especially young people in developing countries, are struggling to find jobs or go from one precarious employment relationship to another. This paradoxical situation is making the notion that we work to live questionable. Even more so when we take a look at work patterns in former times. Douglas Rushkoff explains in a CNN article that jobs as such as well as corporations are a relatively new concept. We may have always worked, but most people just work for themselves, creating value in some way for other people who then traded or paid for those goods and services. Even a work life was rather different back then, as economist Juliet Shaw points out. She says that when we go back 300 to 400 years, most people did not work very long hours at all. While life for medieval peasants was certainly not perfect at all. Shaw says that at the time, the tempo of life was slow, even leisurely. The pace of work relaxed. According to her analysis, the medieval peasant even enjoyed anywhere from eight weeks to half a year off. And it was really only when the industrial age came along that corporate structures were formed on a larger scale. And that from then on, for most of the people, Working came to mean getting a job and being an employee. Moreover, the whole idea of working eight hours a day and having a weekend off was created back then as an effort to cut down on the number of hours of manual labor that workers were forced to endure on the factory floor. When workers fought for the eight-hour workday, they weren't trying to get something radical or new, but rather to restore what their ancestors had enjoyed. This compromise to work 40 hours a week was therefore never based on any scientific understanding of human productivity or happiness and solely a more humane approach to factory work 200 years ago. But it never really changed since. On the contrary, our cultures are even encouraging a strong, meaningless work ethic. Another major argument that makes the notion of work to earn a living questionable is this craft. Rising income inequality, or what could be called a broken income distribution system. Work today in many Western countries often does not pay the bills anymore. It used to be the case that when productivity grew and profits rose and employment rose, that wages grew in parallel. But as it turns out, across the US and the OECD in general, real wages have been stagnating for three decades. 
Another study by the ILO, the Global Wage Report, found that the top 10% of highest-paid workers in Europe together earn almost as much as the bottom 50%. And figures from the Economic Policy Institute reveal a similar story for the US. Whereas in the 60s to 80s, the average CEO was getting only around 20 times the pay of the average worker in the same company. Today, that ratio stands at around 300 times. In the US, this is leading to a situation in which a fourth of the adults actually employed are paid wages lower than would lift them above the official poverty line. And almost half of employed adults are eligible for food stamps. On the other hand, as Matt Brunig points out in an interesting article on Medium, the richest 1% in the US are already receiving large amounts of money without doing any kind of work. Brunig takes data from economists Piketty, Ayers and Sigman, showing that the richest 1% in America received 20.2% of all the income in the nation in 2015. 10 points of that 20.10% came from equity income, net interest, housing rents, and the capital component of mixed income. Which means that 1 in 10 dollars of income produced in the US is paid out to the richest 1% without them having to work for it at all. All of this shows that the notion that work provides the means to live does not hold itself that much anymore. Let us now examine another popular answer to the question of why we work. Namely, work's ability to give us meaning and purpose in life. Now, if you occasionally lack motivation to go to work and often ask yourself why we work, then you might already question this notion. And you're not alone. A poll by global consulting firm Gallup asked 230,000 employees in 142 countries how engaged they are with their job. Turns out that worldwide, only 13% of those with jobs feel engaged with them, while 63% feel not engaged and 24% feel actively disengaged. This is inevitably a result of having to work in order to live and creating jobs firstly so people can earn a living rather than to make them happy or fulfilled in life. So we end up with a situation where you have unemployed people who would like to be employed but those jobs are taken by those who don't really want to be there. However, even though surveys like these have been highlighting the disconnect between work and meaning or purpose of life, we still strongly uphold the notion of career success that prioritizes money and prestige instead of fulfillment and meaning. So what is happening with a society where more than half of the people are unhappy with what they're doing 8 hours a day? Psychologist John F. Schumacher analyzed the rapidly growing rate of depression in industrialized countries and argues that a high percentage of depression cases are actually cases of demoralization, something that he defines as an overarching psycho-spiritual crisis in which victims feel generally disoriented and unable to locate meaning, purpose or sources of need fulfillment. Research shows, as Schumacher points out, that in contrast to earlier times, most people today are unable to identify any sort of philosophy of life or set of guiding principles. This leads us to another answer to why we work. Namely, because work provides value to society. Again, aforementioned polls about unhappy and disengaged workers already show that for these individuals, their jobs do not seem meaningful at all. Another poll among British employees by YouGov revealed that as many as 37% think they have a job that is utterly useless. Anthropologist David Graeber refers to these jobs as bullshit jobs. On paper, these jobs might sound perfect, but every evening these people go home unhappy because to them their work serves no purpose. But how did it come so far? And here precisely lies the mystery, as Graeber points out. In capitalism, this is exactly what is not supposed to happen. 
A profit-seeking firm is obviously not willing to hand out money to employees they don't really need. The problem is that there is a disconnect between what these people think is useful and valuable for society and for themselves and what their employers deem as useful. For the companies, it is usually work associated with an increase in profits, and on a larger scale, it is work that contributes to the growth of the economy. Because, and this is crucial here, economic or GDP growth is still worshipped as the ultimate means to more progress and societal value. But what provides societal value is highly debatable. And this is exactly the point here. For many decades, we seem to have ignored this debate and trusted an ideology that defined economic growth as the value provider. And this is how we end up with a world in which work has become ritualized and detached from the practical things it was invented to accomplish. However, now that we are increasingly confronted with its negative consequences, such as climate change and inequality, it seems like we are slowly beginning to hold this debate again. Even more so, as recent technological advancements suggest a massive wave of automation rolling out. Studies looking at the progress and implementation of advanced robotics and artificial intelligence are implying a new kind of industrial revolution that is unprecedented. An Oxford study estimated that about half of all existing jobs in the US are in danger to be automated in the next 10 to 20 years. The White House, in a report to Congress, has put the probability at 83% that a worker making less than $20 an hour will eventually lose their job to a machine. And the UN, in another report, even predicts that robots will replace two-thirds of all workers in developing countries. And if you think predictions are never to be trusted, then you can look at a recent study by economist Darren Asamuklu of MIT and Pasquale Restrepo of Boston University. They examined the impact of industrial automation on the US labor market from 1990 to 2007. And they concluded that each additional robot reduced employment in a given commuting area by three to six workers, and furthermore lowered overall wages by 0.25 to 0.5%. In addition, consulting firm McKinsey recently published a report which suggests that 45% of work activities in the US could be automated using already existing technology. According to their analysis, about 60% of occupations could have 30% or more of their constituent activities automated. In other words, automation is likely to change the vast majority of occupations, at least to some degree, if not making them even completely obsolete. So keeping in mind everything we have looked at in this video, let's ask ourselves, what's the purpose of the technologies we're creating? What's the purpose of a car that can drive for us? Or artificial intelligence that can show the 60% of our workload? Is it only about generating profits and economic growth? Or should it be about more than that? I personally think it is time to update our worldview. I think it's time to reinvigorate the debate about what provides societal value based on new science, new models, and new values. I personally think that the question we have to begin to ask ourselves is not how do we retrain and employ all the people who are rendered obsolete by technology, which, by the way, is exactly what policymakers around the world are looking into right now. We should instead start with the following questions. How can we provide people with purposeful jobs that make them happy and give them a feeling of self-fulfillment? And how can we more fairly distribute the gains we generate through the work we do and the technologies we create? This will eventually help us to build a future in which the value of our work is not determined by the size of our paycheck or the economic growth we contribute to but rather by the amount of happiness we spread and the value we bring to society. And then, perhaps, this question will become obsolete.